Let me share my screen and we can get things rolling. Okay, so welcome everyone to the final workshop of the semester. It's been a great, uh, it's been a great semester to be able to, uh, you know, have fun with the IEEE, lead the IEEE. We've had a lot of good workshops. It's sad that this is the last one, but that's just how it has to be. Uh, and I'm hoping to make this one of the good one, one of the good workshops that we've had. So with that, uh, welcome to a math light introduction to machine learning with TensorFlow. Did I say the name already? I feel like I said the name already, went on my spiel and then repeated the name. Anyway, so essentially this workshop, we're gonna be covering how to create machine learning models with minimal knowledge of how the math behind the machine learning models works. We're gonna be concerning ourselves a lot more with the code to get stuff set up. One of the biggest things that scares people from machine, from machine learning, learning, someone's echoing, and now they're not, okay. So uh, someone must have not muted. So one of the things that really scares people off from machine learning when they first jump into it is typically just how much math is involved in it. And that can be very scary for some people who aren't uh, well versed in the calculus and everything. But what they don't realize is that modern machine learning, particularly most of these machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, they do all of the math for you behind the scenes. Your only job as the machine learning model creator is to actually figure out what kind of model you want, the shape of the model, and all of the hyperparameters to the model. It's not anywhere near as math heavy as people think it is. Definitely, the best models that you're going to be able to get are going to be custom models that you design with custom activation functions, custom loss functions, and whatnot. It's all application specific in that case. But if you just want a generally good model for a classification task, generation task, you can use off the shelf models basically that TensorFlow can provide easily and just have the ability to work with. Uh, work with these models and work with machine learning with very little understanding of what's actually going on behind the scenes. And I think that one of the best ways to get excited about and get involved in machine learning is through setting up these models and playing around with it and doing classification tasks for yourself. So the way that this is going to work, I'm going to go over a bit on how the, how models work. Uh, we're going to go over a few of the different types of layers. And then at the end, I'm going to do a demo and show off some of the layers actually being used in a TensorFlow model that classifies handwritten digits, which is, it's the MNIST sample. And I'm going to show off two separate types of networks, the pros and cons of each network, how one network is a very basic network, and how one network uses special types of layers to achieve much higher classification accuracy in much fewer pass-throughs of the data. So let's start off with what is machine learning? So I thought that this would be a, uh, a good introduction to people. I know we've had a few machine learning workshops this semester and AI workshops. I thought it was just important to show off that machine learning, essentially, it allows computers to learn from examples without being explicitly programmed to learn from them. And essentially, this is it's a subset of artificial intelligence. I think this is an important thing people realize. This is machine learning is, n while machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence, not all artificial intelligence is machine learning. And then even then artificial neural networks are just a component with, of machine learning, which is what we're gonna be looking at today. And deep learning in particular is just another subset of the artificial neural networks, right? So it's important to be able to distinguish between these and realize that machine learning is not <laughs> sentient robots. We're not gonna get a Terminator out of any of our machine learning techniques. Probably, there's a bit of debate about that, but I'm in the camp firmly that we are not going to be getting a Terminator out of machine learning. So let's talk about what machine learning actually is good for and why we would want machine learning. Gods, well, I fully believe that we're gonna eventually get terminated. Don't get me wrong. We're just not gonna be doing it with neural networks. <laughs> we're gonna be using a uh, symbolic AI most likely. I'm a strong believer in symbolic AI. Anyway, uh, moving forward, what is machine? Was that Jenny the robot? Yes, that was Jenny. If you weren't watching this back in the day on Cartoon Network, you weren't living. 
All right. So. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about what machine learning is good for. So the first thing that we want to talk about is classification problems, regression problems, and essentially classification problems, right? You have two groups of objects, right? And they're separated by some attributes. And you basically just want to figure out what the criteria is for separating them into different groups. So you're classifying things into different groups. One example of a classification problem is the objective of classifying images and what they are, right? So we want to be able to identify this picture and say, okay, this is a picture of a cat. We are classifying this image, which is just data, as a cat, right? And then there's also localization, which is another task where you actually find the area of the image that the cat is. And then, of course, you can have multiple objects and you can classify them independently as separate things, right? So with that, that's our, that's our first big problem. That, that's really what we're going to be focusing on today is just purely classification tasks, which is taking input data and telling us what that data actually is out of some set of classes that we've predefined, right? So beyond that, there's also generation. Um, I'm gonna be going over generation more tomorrow during my research talk, because what I'm using AI for and machine learning for in my research is to actually generate new things, right? So it's one thing to say, okay, this is a cat. It's another thing to tell the AI, draw a picture of a cat that you've never seen before, right? So that's one of that's much that's a much harder problem than identifying the cat because that requires quote unquote creativity right which the ai ne doesn't necessarily have just because it's able to identify what a cat is it cannot necessarily draw a cat in the we can't just reverse the process and go backwards to generate the cat you have to do a lot more than just that to end up actually getting your image, ge your generation of things, right? So there's also uh, I have an example of generation here. How this is a this was a pretty famous AI result a while back where you can draw what you want, and then it would try and generate images based on your little doodle, right? So in this case, we have you see you draw the triangle here, and it's going to spit out some generated images with that triangle. We draw the blue sky above it, and now all of a sudden, all of these images have the blue sky. We draw the grass, and then it puts grass in that image. That's a generation problem, right? It's very, uh, it's much harder to do than just normal classification. So moving forward, let's talk about how machines actually learn, and essentially. We're not actually going to do any of the math tonight. We are going to fully skip the heavy duty math tonight and just focus on the basics and the creation of networks. So let's, uh, yes, that's, we're not, we're not actually looking at that. <laughs> we are, uh, we are skipping that. I just put that there as an example of what you see. Like when you go and try and look up how machine learning stuff works, you get hit with these formulas all the time where you just have no idea what's going on right and it's important to understand eventually i think i think that eventually one day you have to just go in but it's it's good to have the understanding intuitively of what the neural networks and machine learning methods are doing visually before you go in and you actually start trying to understand because if you can understand intuitively what's going on, you're going to be a much more motivated and much and understand better what the math is doing. It's a lot harder to derive intuition from the math than it is to derive intuition from the shape of the network, from the operations of what the network is doing. And it's, it's even easier to drive the math once you see the code. I think that it's a lot, you can drive a lot more intuition about what's going on from the code than you can from mathematical formulas. So let's go take a look at how we're going to be doing this without math. So this is, this is one of the nice things, is that basically modern machine learning frameworks, the hardest part of the math is the backpropagation calculus, which 
it's it's like calc three levels of mathematics you're doing gradient you're working with gradients for those of you who've taken calc three in like thousand dimensional spaces it's it's fun but it's kind of confusing right no, you don't need calc. That's why we uh, we stay away from. <laughs> That's why we're not doing the math tonight. Yeah. So essentially, t the thing that's great is that these modern machine learning frameworks, you don't actually have to know any of the gradients yourself. The machine learning framework, TensorFlow, PyTorch, they do the backpropagation uh, math for you. And essentially, there's only a few things that you actually have to do to get started building classifying machine learning models. And just let you can let TensorFlow take care of the, all of the rest of your issues. So let's talk about what those steps are. So essentially, first, you have to just load your data. And since we're doing, we're going to be doing supervised learning with classification. So we're also going to load our labels, which is going to be part of our data. N then you have to construct the network architecture. Then all you have to do is you have to fit the model by training the data on it, which TensorFlow does for you as well. This entire step is just one function that you have to call on your model. And it does all of the training. It does all of the backpropagation math for you. It's wonderful. And then once you fit the model, you can use your model for whatever your application is. So once the model has been fully trained, you can feed it cat pictures and have it identify as many cats as you want. right? So let's keep looking. Oh, I spelled PyTorch wrong. Troach. PyTroach. Thank you for pointing that out, Matt. OK. So all we have to do is pick our data that we're going to be learning from and then construct the network architecture. That's all we have to focus on as new, Py <laughs> new framework PyTroach just dropped. Yes. OK, so let's talk about what the data that we're actually going to be operating on is. And this is, we can you can literally use whatever data that you want to operate on, as long as there's some pattern re relation. The job of the network is just to find out what that relation is between your data and the labels, essentially, for the classification problem, right? So we can do whatever we want as long as there's like if we just feed a neural network random garbage say we take pictures of static from the television it's not going to be able to classify anything about that it's not it doesn't have any meaning right but as long as we're feeding it meaningful data for a classification problem something that humans could classify we're probably going to see at least decent results when we try classifying things. So in our case, what we care about is we want to train our model to be able to identify handwritten digits. Data is going to be these grayscale images of handwritten digits. Here we have this five, this zero, this four. And with that data, each data has a label associated with it. And the label is what it actually is. And now what we want to be able to do is show our model hundreds of thousands, it's probably just going to be thousands in this case, thousands of examples of handwritten digits with their labels and basically tell it and have it by the end be able to tell us what the image is and spit out the correct label for us. And it's not going to be able to see the label, obviously, when we're passing. All we're passing in is the image. And then when we're training it, we're comparing what it said the label was with the real label to tell it how bad it did. But then once it's done, we're only passing in the image and it's telling us what the label is, right? So if we were training on cats versus dogs, we would pass in a label of cats and dogs with it to tell it essentially what it is. And then the hope is that it learns a more general pattern. So even when we pass in data that isn't in the data set, we pass in a cat picture it's never seen before, it's able to identify that that's a cat with a reasonably high accuracy, right? Does anyone have any questions so far about anything I've said, by the way? I, I don't want to speak so fast that no one yeah, can- Can we do the cat example? The cat example with cats yeah. and dogs? I want to. I want to teach my computer to distinguish cats. I unfortunately have not. Cat. I don't have a cat and first dog data set on hand. I don't know where you would get one. I'm sure those exist. Uh, but at the data set that we're going to be using is for the demos is just going to be the uh, I'm at the handwritten digits example. But by all means, I'm sure that there is a cat data set <laughs> out there.
<laughs> and yes, uh, Nicholas. If I right. find that data set, what we learned today is, am I going to be able to apply that to cats? Yes. Dogs? Yes. If you can take, yeah, 100%. If you can take your, as long as you have images of cats and images of dogs with labels that say cats and dogs. Oh, he found the cats and dogs data set. Oh, man. <laughs> let's, let's take a look at the Kaggle cats and dogs data set. They just linked me to... I'm not... Uh, someone figure out if this is real, and we can uh, we can take a look at this later. Would cats versus dogs be harder to determine? Yes, there's more features. It's essentially... The more complex your images are... In our case, we're keeping things very simple. It's black background, white handwritten digit, right? This is very simple. There's 10 classes. Cats, there's hundreds of colors of cats. It has to learn so much more. So it would be a lot harder to determine. How hard it is to actually classify things, it's very deterministic and based upon the data that you are classifying. Every single problem is different. It's, But you can basically almost always figure out how hard the problem is going to be just off the top of your head. Like, this is a very simple problem because there's not many features, right? The only features are, essentially the features are literally just these images, right? It's black background, white letter. All it has to do is figure out what these shapes basically correspond to. It might do that by breaking these down into parts and then figuring out what parts correspond to which numbers, to which labels, essentially, is the hope, right? So essentially with that knowledge, this is a pretty simple data set to actually classify. Cats versus dogs, on the other hand, the feature space is massive because we're talking millions of different colors of cats, all, cats standing in different positions. There's a lot more that the model has to pick up on that we simply can't even imagine what, what it has to do right there has to be so many free parameters but it it works like people do it there is a cats versus dogs tensorflow example that was just linked yes uh do they have the cats images yeah so there is cats versus dogs do they actually have a cats versus dog data set oh can i just access this actually oh actually if we have if i can just import this actually might just be I might just be able to do this, yeah. Okay, well, we can take a look at this later then and see if we can actually get a cats and dogs <laughs> example going later. I, I just want to know if it's actually in like their data set library because it looks like I might have to download it myself, which I'm not trying to do. Is it in... I don't know if I have the TF data set module, but we'll see later. Okay, so moving forward... All right, so let's talk about what a model actually is. So in terms of a model, this is the stereotypical machine learning model, right? I'm sure you guys have seen these images around, floating around before, right? So what composes a machine learning model in the traditional sense, right? We have layers and neurons. We pass the data in through the front. The data is transformed in the hidden layers. And then the output, in our case, we have 10 different output neurons here. And each of these output neurons corresponds to what digit this is. So we take all of the pixels, we input all of the pixels into this layer, some magic math happens via these perceptrons in the middle, and by the end, we are outputting which one of, whichever one of these is the strongest indicates what digit we're actually classifying. So let's actually talk about what's, what, what composes this model, right? So we have different layers, right? That's the core takeaway. There's this hidden layer right here in the middle that somehow is doing some math magic that's giving us the classification of what this number we're putting in is, right? So let's jump in. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the single layer per perceptron. And Josh actually did a great workshop on this a few weeks ago, where he talked about how these uh, perceptrons work and how we can use these for classification problems. And in Josh's example, we actually got to code the entire perceptron ourselves. TensorFlow does no such thing. We are not going to be 
coding the perceptron ourselves, they provide all of this for us. So essentially what you can use this for is just basic simple prediction tasks. And so normally perceptrons, these single layer perceptrons, they're really only taught uh, basically you use them to basically teach how the math behind perceptrons works. Um, and we're going to give an over Josh's workshop again. It's on YouTube, provides a great overview of this. So what's actually happening here with the single layer perceptron? So what's happening is we have our input layer here, right? And this input, we can imagine it as the pixels, right? The pixel values. So again, if we look back here, we see that there's grayscale pixels, white pixels. These are floats that we're putting in on this input layer, right? Just how dark is the pixel, right? And again, you could invert this, it wouldn't matter. There's essentially the core takeaway is you're taking a float and putting all of these floats in as the values input into our network. Now, we put the floats in, and then what's happening is each of these floats has a weight associated with it. And this is a tunable parameter. And we're not going to go into this too much because that would be too mathy. And we're trying to stay away from the math. But I just want to basically explain what's going on in the big picture. So you have your input float. You have a weight, which is another float. And then you sum up your weights and your inputs for all of your inputs. And then once you sum them up, you add a bias to it, which is another tunable parameter. So there's two different types of parameters. There's tunable parameters and there's hyperparameters. And basically we say hyperparameters to denote anything that the model isn't learning. The way that the model actually works is we sum, we sum these up, right? We sum up our weights times our inputs, and then we add the tunable bias, and then we pass it through an activation function. and our activation function stays the same every for every single training sample. We run hundreds of thousands of training samples through our network, but every single time, every single epoch, we're updating the weights and the biases. And that's how we're actually learning, is the back propagation, which we're not going to be discussing in depth, is coming through here and going backwards and updating the weights and biases to better fit our data. And that's how mm -hmm. machine learning really works. But we are not go. We don't have to concern ourselves with that because mm -hmm. TensorFlow does all of this for us. So all that we care about is this activation function. And this activation function stays the same every single time, right? So the question now is: Okay, so we have this activation. Uh, we have this activation function hyperparameter, right? So what do we actually set as this activation function hyperparameter? Well. There's actually a lot of fighting about this <laughs> in the machine learning community. There's a lot of disagreement over what works best. Normally, what ends up happening, people seem to think that machine learning is a very hard science, when in reality, machine learning is a lot of guess and check. Uh, you will try a bunch of different things and hope it works better than your previous thing. Uh, it's not like if you use a different loss function, your model is going to completely break. Some will work better than others for some cases. So people normally, what they do is they will test out. Normally what you do is you'll you'll try sigmoid and you'll try relu. Sometimes you'll try tan h. Leaky relu is also good in some cases. And basically you'll just try your model with all of these and see which one works best for your application. It's really data dependent. But long story short, the idea of this is, the reason we do this is because when we sum up all of the weights and the, when we sum up all of the weights and the inputs and then add on that bias term, this could be a really large number, but we don't necessarily want a really large number. We wanna regularize that down to one. And that's what this sigmoid function does as our activation function is essentially it squishes things down to be between one and zero, right? And then that makes the outputs, it normalizes it, right? It makes it a lot more interpretable to following layers. So there's a lot of different activation functions. We have relu here, which is zero for everything under zero. And then doesn't actually squish and just keeps on going. There's some times where you would want this. Tan H is another thing that squishes it between two values. But there's traditionally sigmoid was used, but nowadays we see that relu is used more. But now there's also these leaky relus and elus as well, which 
are gaining popularity. This one's continuous. This one's not. There's big fights over what to use <laughs> for these. But essentially, this activation function is one of the most important parameters that is the least understood. And if you want a more in-depth overview of this, you can. Uh, I will link this article for how to choose your activation function for your application. Oh. Okay, so moving on. Oh, it on. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about multi-layer perceptrons. And now this is what this is what we care about. This is the one that uh, we're actually going to do a demo of today. So the multi-layer perceptron takes the single-layer perceptron and just adds a ton of these on top of each other, basically. So inside of one perceptron node, you have the input sum, the act, and the activation function, right? So what this does is each one of these nodes has the it sums everything coming in with a weight adds a bias to it, and then passes it through an activation function. And now there's all of this math, but all we have to think about is math does stuff that makes it easier for us to, that basically does the classification for us. We don't actually really have to care how it does the classification and how that math relates to the classification. All we have to care about is the fact that it works and TensorFlow takes care of it for us. I cannot stress this enough. So basically what we do is we take all 784 of our pixels, we throw them into this hidden uh, layer, and what ends up happening is it does the math for us in here, and then it basically connects to this final output layer, and then this just tells us what exactly we were looking at, right? If we're passing in an eight, we would expect the eighth node to be the most heavily lit up. We're gonna be doing something, uh, there's another, activation function called the softmax activation function, which I've uh, we haven't been discussing. But essentially, the softmax activation function makes it so your final layer is the probability that the current sample is one, is one of these classes. So each of these nodes, output nodes, corresponds to the digits 0 through 9. And if we use a softmax activation function on this final layer, then we will see that the first one is the percent chance that it's a one, the percent chance that it's a two, of how much it, the percent chance that it thinks, quote unquote, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Or eight or nine, yeah. So with that, we're able to actually predict and classify what these inputs are. So Essentially, this is like the first real. And so what we can do is we can actually stack these deep layers in series with each other. So we can add another one of these uh, hidden layers right here, right next to it, and add as many of those as we want. And now we have a real deep learning model, right? And that's why it's called deep learning, is because you add in all of these networks, these uh, layers, these connected layers, these multi-layer perceptron net layers, and it becomes a deep network. Um, essentially, the more of these, the way that I like to think about this is the more of these layers that we add on, the better it helps us learn complex features. Because each time we add a new network on, I, or my bad, not a new network, every time we add a new layer on, we have more tunable hyperparameters, not hyperparameters, regular parameters, tunable parameters to help us learn what exactly we're trying to classify. And the more tunable parameters that we have, the easier it is for it to classify more complex data because it's encoding. The general idea of these machine learning frameworks is that we're trying to encode underlying features into our weights and our biases. And that's what's important. And the more layers we have, the more weights and biases we have to play around with to encode those features, right? So I have a list of the hyperparameters now. So once we get to a multi-layer perceptron network, we have to decide the activation function for all of these nodes, which we always almost keep the same. There's really no reason to interleave uh, activation functions. And we have to decide the number of hidden nodes in each uh, layer, right? 
And traditionally, you'll have different sized layers, uh, and they'll kind of compress down. So you're getting more and more meaningful features as you get closer to this output space. In this example, we have a 784 dimensional input, and then we have a 10 dimensional hidden layer, and then a 10 dimensional output. Traditionally, you use is the left node connected to is each left node connected to the middle section? Yes, every single left node here is connected to the hidden layer. All 784 nodes are connected to each node in the middle. So because of that, the number of weights that we have is 784 times 10 for between these two layers. So that's a lot of tunable parameters. And when you start to think about it in terms of that, so that's 7,840 tunable parameters in this layer alone, it starts to make a lot more sense why machine learning is so quote unquote powerful, right? It's trying to encode those features in all of those weights. That is a lot of damage, yes. So does anyone have any questions before we uh, move on? No? Are we sure? <laughs> I know this is a lot to take in, and I'm not very satisfied with my uh, ability to explain it. So by all means, if anyone has any questions at all, James, you did a great job. This. Thank you, you did, John. You did a great job. I'm happy that you feel that way <laughs> because I do not. I do not feel like I gave. I did this justice. If you start, I probably should have started from the code. It's it's probably easier to understand it if you're going through the code rather than just these pictures, right? So we have these hyperparameters, and we're going to see that these hyperparameters come into play later when we actually have to create the neural network in TensorFlow. So let's move on to convolutional neural networks, which now we're stepping things up a bit. We're moving on to fancy new layer types. So no longer do we just have these perceptrons as our uh, nodes, right? This is the traditional deep learning stuff. This new convolutional neural network uh, format essentially introduces these new layer types that are much better at dealing with certain types of data. So we're going to see here that convolutional neural networks can be used to do things like they work really well with images because images, in this case, we're basically splitting this eight up into pixel values and then just feeding it in as floats to 784 dimensions. But we're losing a lot of information here because we don't actually, it doesn't give us like implicitly what pixels are related to the pixels around it. The whole idea behind convolutional neural networks is that we actually get to preserve the information of pixels close to a pixel. And the way that we do that is through convolution and max pooling. And essentially we compress the data down into feature maps using convolution. And then we cut those feature maps to their most important components using max pooling layers. So let's just actually take a look at what's going on here in this convolutional neural network. So the first thing it does is it does a process called convolution on this pixel image. Now, this doesn't have to be ones and zeros. This is like if it's a black and white image, it'll be ones and zeros, right? But if it's a real image, you're going to have like multiple dimensions here. It's going to be like uh, three dimensions with your RGB colors and stuff. But for our example, let's just pretend that our convolutional, uh, our data is literally just going to be black and white images with ones and zeros. So what you do is you take a kernel and a kernel is just a chunk of the image and you go through each pixel by pixel and you take that kernel and you convolute essentially, you take the values of the pixels around it and you apply some mathematical function on it, pass it through an activation function, and then output it to a new layer. So the way that this works is, say we want to convolute for this pixel right here that my mouse is on, that I hope everyone can see my mouse on. What we do is we take the values of all of the pixels surrounding it, we apply some mathematical function. This convolution one, is they're literally just adding. That's all they're doing. So in this example, all they're doing is they are adding up every single one in this block. So why don't we do that as well? One, two, three, four, five, 
six. So this would output. Oh, did I do this wrong? Hang on. No, they're wrong. They literally just put the wrong thing <laughs> for no reason. So let, let's just follow their example then. Let's do. Oh, I see. They're actually applying a thing here first. Okay, that's why. So essentially what you do is you take this area, you apply some mathematical function to obtain your kernel, and then you apply another function on your current. So in this example, they're literally just adding up all of the kernel values to get their final result. So that's what convolution does. And what the important thing about convolution, the important thing to think about is this is pretty intuitive. The importance of a pixel is determined by the importance of what's around it, right? It doesn't, a pixel on its own is really hard to interpret meaning from unless we're also taking into account the values of the pixels around it. So that's why convolutional neural networks work so well for images is because we're moving from literally just interpreting every single pixel as an independent value that's not associated with each other. And the network has to figure out which pixels are associated with each other to we're implicitly taking the pixels surrounding it to generate features about it. And then the next thing that we do after we finally generate all of those features is we run it through a max pooling layer. Now, a max pooling layer is exactly what you think it would do. Well, ideally, exactly what one would think it would do. It basically cuts the number of features down in the feature map to only the most important features. So what we do is say we generate a convoluted feature like this. Uh, then what we do, say, let's say we generate something like this instead, right? What we do is we, if we do a two by two, two max pool, what we do is we split it into two by two squares and we take the most important value in those two by two squares and then create a new square that's basically just the maximum values. That's why it's called max pooling from those values, right? So we see that 112 is the highest in this blue square and we put 112 in here. And what this does is it allows us to just take the most important features from our uh, feature map which is also, they're calling the convoluted feature, right? This is also called a feature map, which I'm gonna be talking about more. But we can see that in a convolutional neural network, normally what you have is you will be passing your data through first a convolution layer, then you'll be passing it through a max pooling layer, then you'll do another convolution layer, then max pooling again. And then finally, at the end, you'll pass it into a traditional neural network to do your classification with your multi-layer perceptrons, right? So there's also this layer here that's the flattening layer. And all the flattening layer does, it's rather straightforward. It takes, <coughs> excuse me, the, it takes square data and converts it into linear data, right? So we can think of this as actually being, there being an implicit flattening layer here that converts this image of God knows what, like 32 by 32 pixels or something into this massive line, right? Now it's an array, right? Rather than just a square, right? It's converting the data into that shape, the shape that we want. Flattening converts from square data, if you will, matrices or tensors into one dimensional linear data, right? So that's all the flattening layer does. It doesn't do any math. Uh, it literally just converts square data into a line that we can then pass into our linear uh, normal multilayer perceptron neural networks, right? So those are the three new types of layers that we're analyzing, that come along with the convolutional neural networks. Does anyone have any questions about any of these new layers? No questions about the new layers. Does everyone understand convolution? This is the most that we're going to be using today. We're going to be doing a convolutional neural network to help identify handwritten digits. I'm going to go over something next that we are not actually going to do today. And in fact, I may well just skip it because it's 842 and it's the most complicated form of ne neural network that I'll be discussing tonight. And it's a bit above my uh, pay grade to discuss in detail. All right, any questions about last chance CNNs before we move on? Okay, so, oh yeah. So the hyperparameters that we actually care about for each of these layers, each layer has 
different hyperparameters that you can tune to get different behavior out of the layer. The kernel size is the number of pixels around it that we're going to be using to do the convolution. So in this example, we're doing a three by three kernel. We are taking three by three pixels around the current. Uh, we're taking three. We're taking one pixel above, one pixel below. Basically, all the pixels that surround it. A five by five kernel would add another row of squares around this, right? Another box of squares around this that we're taking the pixel values from, right? So we're just doing a three by three convolution layer here. Um, and then of course the activation function as well, we apply on, we can apply an activation function on the final value that comes out of our convolution uh, for a feature map. And that is another hyperparameter we have access to. Um, max pooling layers, we only have access to the pooling size. So in this case, we're doing two by two. If it's bigger, of course, you can do three by three pooling. There's a lot of different options you have. So there's a lot of uh, CNNs have been some of the most famous uh, neural networks out there. Uh, back in, I th it was 1989, they developed LeanNet, which was really the first uh, widely praised convolutional neural network. And that was designed to get really good performance on this MNST data set. Before this, we only had were able to get like I want to say it was like 80% accuracy on handwritten digits. Like bypassing this into a multi-layer perceptron, you can't actually, there's like a cap. Eventually the features are just too complex and too subtle for our multi-layer perceptron networks to be able to identify the correct handwritten digit. So it can get it right about like 90% of the time, but unfortunately it's not 100% of the time. This takes it up to about 98% of the time we're getting the correct we're getting the correct digit and we can see that the way that they actually did this linet essentially you passed in the image as 28 by 28 with one channel of color right and then it's going to run convolution with a 5 by 5 kernel we're going to ignore the padding right for now uh, and the stride as well. <laughs> uh, but essentially then we do a pooling layer, another convolution layer with five by five kernel, another pooling layer, and finally into the dense layers, which is again, the multi-layer perceptron layers with uh, 120, then we get smaller and smaller. And then finally the final layer, we have 10 classes, each of which being a handwritten digit. And we can see that here in our uh, example, right? We have a 28 by 28 image, uh, and then we pass it into the convolution layer, pooling layer, convolution layer, pooling layer, flattening, uh, the flatten right here, they just implicitly do it. You'll see these uh, underneath this, this is the sigmoid, which again, activation function, convolution layers can use activation functions, pooling layers don't use activation functions, sigmoid. But then in about 2012, AlexNet won some massive competition from Google for classifying images. And it was about 10% better than the runner up, which is like really insane, at least back in the day. And again, it's quite literally, if we can see how much more complicated it is down here, but it uses the exact same pattern that they were using like uh, 20 years previously, right? It's convolution to pooling to convolution to pooling. Then he does a bunch of convolutions. And then finally he does pooling. And then he's just using a lot more of these fully connected neurons. He's using a ReLU activation function. He's also using something called Dropout, which I'll go into more uh, later. And then, yeah, into these fully connected things. And then he gets to have a thousand classes. So he's classifying thousands of different types of images, cats, dogs, uh, duct tape, spatulas, pans, pots, you know, you name it. Like that's uh, how, you know, when you recommend, you ask Google to identify an image, right? They're using some insane massive network that's probably some descendant of the AlexNet style, right? So moving on, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks very briefly because these are really, uh, things can get pretty crazy with recurrent neural networks. The general idea is that essentially they're really good with time dependent sequences like language and speech. So for example, when I speak and I say things to you, you have to remember what the previous words I said were if you want to understand the word that I'm currently saying. Data only makes sense in the context that what I've previously said uh, essentially matters to what I'm currently saying, right? You have to at least have short-term memory of 
the sentence that I've been saying to understand the word that I'm currently saying. Otherwise, it's just a word and you can't make any sense of it. So if you want to identify like the mood of a sentence and stuff, you need to actually have knowledge of what was previously said in the sentence. You can't just assume because you see the word bad in a sentence that the mood of the sentence is negative. That wouldn't work. You actually have to know about what the mood of the sentence leading to the word bad was in order to identify that, right? And there, there have been a bunch of naive attempts to identify mood without doing stuff like that, but we've noticed, uh, at least in the end, it's very important that you're able to identify essentially the mood. Uh, you're, ba you're able to remember previous statements, essentially. That's what's really important. And the recurrent network, what the recurrent network is able to do is by looping outputs back of layers into previous layers, or even looping node output back to itself, you're able to actually remember things within the network for later use. So this is just a simple recurrent network. And we can see that the output of one layer is being fed into the input of another layer. This works OK for some things, but it doesn't really get powerful until you start delving into long short-term memory networks, which use these spe special LSTM cells. And inside of each of these LSTM cells, we have a bunch of fancy stuff that I'm not going to go into. But the core takeaway is that you have your LSTM cells have a memory of previous inputs to them that they're able to essentially remember the most important information for later on. That way, they're able to do much better at language prediction tasks. So you use LSTM tasks when you have, essentially, they're really good with se sequences. So if you have sequence data, you might want to consider using LSTM nodes rather than normal nodes, right? The same way if you're using images, you'd want to use a convolutional neural network, right? In general, right? So in general, if you're working with images, a convolutional neural network is what you want to use. In general, if you're using a, if you're working with speech and language, you're going to want to use LSTMs, transformers nowadays. These are also really good for working with language. There's a lot. So this is basically the core divide between machine learning, right? Computer vision, which focuses on convolutional neural networks, and natural language processing, which focuses on recurrent neural networks. That's again very general. By no means is that the core focus is also graph learning, which both parties use for certain things. There's a lot more stuff, but in general, that's at least my understanding of the great divide in machine learning between the computer vision people and the natural language processing people. So with that, we're not going to be touching recurrent neural networks at all today. I do use an LSTM in the research talk that I'm going to be giving tomorrow because we're using sequential data. So look forward to an LSTM tomorrow. <laughs> but let's talk about now how we actually build the networks in TensorFlow. So Keras, which is TensorFlow's modeling library, basically lets us specify whatever layers we want. And we literally just have to throw them into an array together. And that's the network. It's that easy. And you'll see that on the next slide. So each of the layers, each of the layers that we've talked about today has a TensorFlow or a Keras equivalent. These multi-layer perceptron network layers are TF Keras layers dense. These are just dense, they're just called dense layers, right? Um, our convolutional layers are con called Conv2D. There's also Conv3D, so you were working on spatial data instead, and as well as multi-channel images, right? So for example, if you have an RGB image, you can represent like AlexNet does here, you have an image that's 240, 224 by 224 with three color channels. So now your kernel actually has to take into account the fact that it's three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional, right? So we're just going to be using Conf2D because we're just using black and white images. And Conf2D is, is just a 2D, we use a 2D kernel instead of a 3D kernel, right? So, but keep in mind this can generalize up you can go even higher with more dimensions and whatnot so then we have our max pooling layers max pooling 2d again you can also do 3d pooling if you have 3d feature maps 
Um, the flattening layer literally just converts multi-dimensional data into a single dimensional data. No fancy math behind it. It just converts a, you can think of it as literally just taking, taking a matrix and putting it into an array. Um, RNN layers, simple RNN, uh, basically only has short-term memory. We're not going to be dealing with this today. And then finally, LSTM layers, which remembers important past data. So we are, today we are going to be looking at about three of the or four of these. We're going to be using dense, conf2d, max pooling, and flatten. So let's actually take a look at how you do this in TensorFlow. The code is rather straightforward. You create a model by doing keras.sequential. Sequential just means, of course, these are sequential models, right? Like when we talk about sequential, it's a sequence of layers. Layer one, layer two, layer three, right? Same with the con same with convolutional neural networks. Layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, right? So let's go back and and again we can see that here even more that it's just a sequence of layers that are being connected, right? That's really the big core takeaway here is that whatever application you have in machine learning, it's always going to just be a combination of these layers. And you're not really working with the math, you're more working with, okay, what order should I put these layers in to that best suits my application? And for convolutional neural networks, it's convolution pooling, convolution pooling, dense, dense, dense. Uh, and for LSTMs, it's LSTM, dense layer, LSTM, dense layer, if you want a stacked LSTM, which we will not get into. But let's take a look at what we have here. So this here is just quite literally a multi-layer perceptron thing, uh, network, right? We are we have our input, we flatten our input. Our input is an image, it's a 28 by 28 image. We flatten it and then we feed it into 16 dense activate, dense neuro, uh, it's 16 hidden neurons with a sigmoid activation, another 16, and we feed that layer into 16 neurons with a sigmoid activation again. And then finally, we have our last layer, which is also a dense layer. We can literally see that this almost perfectly models this right here, except there's 16 neurons here instead of 10. And then we have another hidden layer here with 16 instead of 10. And then our final, we for our final layer, we have 10. And there's an implicit hidden flattening layer that's converting this square data into the array that we're passing each of these floats into, right? So it's literally you just have to create an array of these, right? So we have the input shape, we flatten the input, we pass that into the dense, first dense layer, the second dense layer, the third dense layer, right? Now, this example is a convolutional neural network. So we can see that we do, we have, we take our image, we do convolution 2D, max pooling 2D, convolution 2D, max pooling 2D, and then finally we flatten, before passing it into our dense network, there is a dropout layer here. Now, dropout layers are actually pretty straightforward to explain. Essentially, all a dropout layer does is you hook it up in between two layers and it will ignore inputs from one layer coming through to the next layer. So essentially, it's just an extra layer that will randomly drop a percent of the outputs as your input. So in our case, I'm passing in 0 0.5, which means randomly drop 50% of the outputs from the previous layer. And the reason we do this is to avoid overfitting. Um, overfitting is an issue in machine learning where you match the training data so well that you're not able to generalize to data beyond that. For example, if I train on, if I create, this is the danger of playing around with these networks too much is, you could, if you add, say for example, you add 10,000 neurons here and 10,000 layers of those neurons, you will literally remember every single training data example inside of those weights and biases have 100% training accuracy, but the second you put in a piece of data that isn't in your data set, it will have no idea what to do because it's literally game to the system by just memorizing every single possible data example that you've passed into it in its weights and biases. The goal is to constrain the net. You want the network to be powerful enough that it has good accuracy. You want it to be big enough that it has the ability to store features, but you don't want it to be so big that it memorizes the training data sample for sample. And 
because of that, isn't able to generalize up. You want to constrain your network enough to be able to derive meaningful properties out of your training data rather than just storing the training data itself and regurgitating it, right? The same way when you're learning math, it's one thing to, it, you could, if you had a brain the size of uh, the sun, you could memorize every single test answer to every single question that could possibly be on the test, right? You could do that, but it's much simpler to just memorize the formula, learn the formula and apply the formula. That's the goal of us creating these neural networks. We want it to learn the formula. We don't want it. We don't want to give it the ability to learn every single answer for the data that we're giving it, right? So that's really, it's a balance when you're designing these networks. Don't give the network too much room to memorize the training data, but don't make it small enough that it's going to have terrible accuracy. But it's always better to start off small and work your way up. And there is a way, of course, there's validation data where we can see if we're overfitting by accident. And that's where we're going to see, uh, we're not going to deal with that today, but in real applications, that's important. You want to make sure that you're not overfitting too much, because if you're overfitting too much, the network is just pulling a big brain and memorizing all of the training data and not actually learning the stuff behind the data, which is what you actually want it to learn. You want it to be able to generalize it to data that it's never seen before and not just memorize all of the data to get perfect accuracy. So moving forward... Let's actually talk about training. So training is comically easy as well. You compile your model, and then you just call the fit method, and that's it. That's all machine learning. Uh, that's, that's TensorFlow. So let's actually take a look at some of these models. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by essentially explaining every single line of code in here. Does anyone have any questions about anything I've been over in the presentation, by the way? Is it up to you when to stop inputting test data or does it warn you when to stop? So, okay, this is, we're going to go over this more in, no, I, I understand what you're saying. So essentially the way that you feed your data into the network, and this is, this is a thing that I probably haven't gone over enough with the training. When you call the fit method, what happens is it takes the entire data set and passes it through the model and it basically, the model spits out what it thinks the right answer is, compares that against the label, and then back propagates using calculus to figure out what the new values of the weights and biases are to move in the right direction towards the real value, to move towards basically minimizing the difference between the output of the model and what the output was supposed to be, right? So we go through the entire data set thousands of times. Uh, for real applications. We will run through the data set like 2,000 times and just do it over and over and over again. We break the data set up into batches for stochastic gradient descent, which we're not going to go into here, but there's a lot more stuff under the hood for training that's a lot more mathy, but essentially you can potentially, it's dangerous to do go through the data set too many times. It won't warn you, but you can see in graphs that sometimes if you go through the data too many times, you will eventually overfit to the point where it's like not okay anymore. In fact, if I go to, let's see if jawswall.net DMM visualizer, let's see if I can find an example of overfitting in one of these where we go for way too many epochs and it just, it gets mad and the accuracy starts going down. Okay, so here we have an example of a machine learning model where essentially we can see that it gets up to 40% accuracy, but then we pass the every single one of these epochs, we're passing the entire data set through. So we can see here that the accuracy for the model on the first epoch, it gets pretty good. It peaks around 500, but then all of a sudden we're training too much and then our accuracy starts going down and then levels out. So it is a danger to basically go through your training data too much. It's dangerous in some cases, but normally if you're doing it right, it should plateau and never go down. There are cases where it does, 
but it's more on the rare side. And the only way to figure out if that's actually happening is to generate graphs like this, where you can basically visualize, okay, the data, it, the accuracy is really good, and then it starts going down. Yeah. So there's definitely instances where that does happen, but um, normally you just want to go through the data as much as you can, if that makes sense. There's definitely, but I, again, it's all application specific. So I always recommend graphing your output and doing grid searches like this. Um, do people calculate local maximums to get the best epoch? Basically, yes, you can do that. You can see, you can take a look at stuff like this and then have it basically be like, okay, where was my thing the highest? Okay, we'll train up to that point and then just cut it off. People do that. Yeah, that is uh, that is a method that I've seen used before. Um, where you can basically calculate the maximum epoch of all of these epochs. This looks continuous. This isn't continuous. It's discrete. These epochs are discrete. You can literally just say what was the maximum it, arc max, right? The, uh, what epoch had the best accuracy and then train it again and then just stop there. I, I've seen people do it before in the past, but it's, uh, again, normally you want your model to just have a nice straight curve going up and ideally keep going up, but at a slower rate. That's normally what you're going to see. So any other questions? Okay. Well, let's start going over the code for the basic mm -hmm. neural network here using TensorFlow. So. Let's talk about what's actually going on here. So we import NumPy. We import, I actually don't know if I'm using NumPy. Why am I importing NumPy if I'm not using NumPy? What a waste. Wait, it's not warning me that I'm not using NumPy, which now makes me sus that I am secretly using NumPy somewhere. <laughs> and then if I get rid of this, it's going to be very bad. You know what? I don't think I am. So we're not using NumPy. We can get rid of NumPy. OK. So. Uh, you import TensorFlow as TF. We imp from TensorFlow, we import Keras. And then from TensorFlow Keras, we import layers. And essentially, this Keras layers contains, you might remember from the presentation that I gave, is what actually contains all of the different layer types that we can put together to build a neural network model, right? So let's take a look at what's actually in there. How about... So... Keras layers, not dense. I just want the layers module in general. So we can see that there is quite a few, quite a few different layers that we have access to. There's a lot of convolution layers, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of pooling layers, uh, recurrent layers, as we saw before, LCM layers. There's a lot of different built-in layer types. And if for some reason you're a researcher and you want to implement a custom layer, they give you access to all of that as well. Of course, then you actually have to know the math behind all the layers. But of course, if you're a researcher who's working on this stuff, you'll know all the math and be comfortable changing things as well. So there's, they give you a lot of freedom to work within the framework. So we're importing Keras layers. So let's talk about first num classes. What are the classes? Well, the classes are just, in our case, the digits zero through nine classes being different the classes that our data can take on right the values that our numbers can be there's only 10 different things that a number can be it can be zero through nine in our case a handwritten digit can be a zero through a nine right and that's our classes all right, so then our, the input shape of our data. So when we talk about the shape of data, we're really talking about the shape of the uh, matrix coming in, right? So because the data that we have access to is going to be a, we're basically taking these MNIST data, uh, the images, right? The uh, images of the images of handwritten digits. These are 28 by 28 images with one color channel, black and white, right? Black. To gray, so it's like zero to two five five, or something similar, right? So let's actually take a look. So the shape of our data, twenty eight by twenty eight images with one color channel, that is the shape of our data. So now we actually get to load the data in. And here, let me zoom in. Can everyone see this well enough, or should I? I should probably zoom. Okay. So Keras data sets MNIST load data. So Keras, thankfully, comes built in with these data sets for us to just take uh, take advantage of. We can literally just 
load this entire data set from this function to test our network on. Normally, you would, if you're working on custom data, you write a custom data input pipeline, which you can then use whatever custom images you want. This comes in just a nice format where we're able to just load it just like this. Otherwise, you have to write a uh, data set loader and it's uh, it's fun. I've uh, I had to do it like two weeks ago. So what's actually coming in here now is we have our training images, our training labels, our testing images, and our testing labels. So for a moment, let's ignore the testing, but let's talk about training. So the training images are, is the data set that we are actually training the model on. This is the data that, this, these are the uh, handwritten digits that we are going to be passing through our model. There's gonna be like 2000 of these, I wanna say, probably more, um, that we're going to be passing through our model every single epoch. And then we have the training labels. And so the training images is the actual data for the picture of the handwritten digit, right? All of those pixel data, all that pixel data. The training label is the actual value of the digit. So for example, if in index zero, we have this picture of an eight, then in index zero of training labels, we have the actual number eight, right? Like the class that we actually care about. So with that, we then have our, so we have our images, we have our labels. Next up is the testing data. So what actually ends up happening is the testing data, we split up the training data and the testing data. So the data set contains hundreds of thousands of basically just images and labels, right? But we split that up into training and testing. And what the testing is, it's instances of the data that aren't in that we don't train on so we can test overfitting afterwards. So if we make the model way too big, which we can actually demonstrate afterwards, we can significantly overfit. And we'll see that when we test the model on the train on the testing data, we'll see that it has terrible accuracy because it memorized the training data, which is going to be very funny to see. So we basically just split our data into training data and testing data. Again, the point of the training data is to give the model something to learn from. The point of the testing data is to show it something it's never seen before to test how well its knowledge has generalized, right? So if we think back to the math formula example that I gave earlier, this is like giving it hundreds of thousands of math problems of one format. And then this is problems it's never seen before. If it knows the formula, it will be able to solve these no problem. If it's learned the formula from the inputs and outputs of the math problem, then it's gonna be able to solve these no problem. But if it hasn't learned the formula and it's just memorized all of its, <laughs> all of the problems, then it's going to fail on all of these and be miserable, right? So that's why we need to split it up into training and testing and why they, they automatically do that for us when it returns from this. It literally pass, it lets us pass it. Python variable declaration is kind of weird, by the way. Some of you are probably wondering why in God's name we're passing. We have this uh, tuple right here, comma this tuple right here. Th basically, long story short, this is passing back a tuple of tuples. And in Python, you're able to declare, for example, in Python, you can do a comma b equals one comma two. The value of a is one, the value of b is two. I don't know how many of you have seen that before from Python. Basically what's going on here is then let's say you have a tuple, which is basically just a static array that can't be edited. So we have a tuple one, two, one, let's say two, three here. And then we can assign these names like this. And now A, B, C, D. So all that's happening in this case is that this is passing back data in this format and we're just assigning names to the data. And now we have access to those variables. So now down here, we would have access to A, right? So that's that's how this works in Python. It, I know it's kind of scary to see that for the first time, but it's really, it's Pythonic, quote unquote. It's kind of strange if you're coming from a language like C where you can't do anything like this at all or Java, but it's kind of a nice way to be able to load data in, right? It just expands the data and lets you name basically data from tuples. So moving forward, we split up our training data and our testing data, and we have our training images and we have our training labels. Next, what we do is we convert our training labels into 
categorical uh, labels. So the way that we can do this, let's actually take a look. So I'll run the model for us. So we can actually take a look inside of all of this data, which is one of the fun things about having access to a debugger. Let's go. So, okay. Why is it? Oh, it's still loading the... Okay, so it takes this hot second to load that because there's just so much data. So moving on, let's take a look at the debug console. And now we are going to delve into the actual values of what's inside of these variables. So if we take a look at the training images, we are going to see that the training images is... Let's take a look at the shape. Train images, uh, shape, and we are going to see that we have 60,000 handwritten digits, 28 by 28 handwritten digits. So inside of this, if we take one of these, let's just take the first one, we are going to see that we now have all of these arrays. These are pixel values. Each one of these is a pixel value. This is a 28. This is the first row of pixels. This is the second row of pixels. And let's actually take a look at what this is. So if we take a look at train labels, what is this? Five. OK, this is a five. <laughs> so all of these pixel values correspond to the number five. And if we actually did an output of this, we would be able to see that this is a five. Um, we are not going to do an output of this. I feel like there's a way you can do that in. Is there actually just a really simple pie plot way I can just cheese this and get the output? I feel like there is. Make an MNIST image. Why does I, do I have a sinking feeling that I created this file to do just that and then ended up not doing it? Oh, no, that's for something else. I know what that's for. <laughs> OK, so in our case, this co all we have to know is like this corresponds to a five, right? So then the next one, the next training label, whatever the next thing is, is a zero. And we're going to have 60,000 of these handwritten digits, right? A whole 60,000. So training labels here, if we actually take a look at what training labels are, we have, again, this is going to be 60,000 uh, basically of labels. The index position corresponds to the actual data in the training images. All right, right. So Let's actually take a look at what this Keras utils to categorical does. Um, so once we run this, now let's take a look at training labels. My guess is that we have converted it to, okay, I know exactly what this did. <laughs> so this did, uh, this basically did convert it to a encoded representation. So now if we actually take a look at what's inside of training labels, we are going to see training labels now. We've basically mapped it. So instead of just being five, we've set it to this array of zeros with a one here uh, in the fifth position. And it's going to do that for all of them. So for example, you might remember the training labels one was a zero last time. So now if we check out what it is, we see that in the zeroth position, we've put a one and we've put zeros in all the other positions. The reason that we're doing this is because we want to compare the output of this final layer of perceptrons to the correct category using mean squared error. And to do that, we need to have it in that form so we can see that it's basically, so that the network can learn that, right? So essentially all that's going on here is we've converted our training labels from numbers to what the output of the network should look like. If we are classifying, that, that's probably a better explanation. If we're classifying an eight, right? We expect the eighth network, the eighth node to be 100% sure that it's an eight, have this be a one, and have the rest of these be zeros. So all we're doing is converting our labels to the prop, what we expect the output of the network to be, right? Does this make sense? I hope that makes sense. And we're doing the same thing with our testing labels, OK? So moving forward, we're going to see that we actually build the entire model here. So this is where we, uh, we saw this before, right? We're going to build our model with Keras Sequential. All we have to do, Keras sequential, we do Keras input for the input shape. Our input shape is 28 by 28 with one color channel. Then we flatten it down into just one long array that we can, one long 784 dimensional array that we can feed into the network. And now we just build the network simply by putting it into an array, right? We have a one layer of 16 dense neurons with a sigmoid activation. I think by default, it has a sigmoid activation, so we might not need to actually specify that. But 
Again, this 16 here, basically, this is a hyperparameter for this layer that tells it how many nodes am I going to have in this layer? How many of these do we get? And then we chain that up to a second guy who also has 16. And then at the end, we go down and we have the number of classes. We have 10 classes, right? Because at the end, we're only classifying 10 things. We want the output of this network to have 10 different uh, classes that we can go to, right? So finally, I do model summary. This is actually going to print out a summary of the model so we can actually see it. And then we're going to move on to the training phase. So why don't we actually just actually take a look at the summary of the model? So if I run this, <laughs> are you OK, stream? Do you need an explanation on anything? OK, so let's take a look at what's actually in here. So we have our flatten layer. And we can see that the flatten layer converts those 28 by 28 images into 784 dimensional, uh, a 784 dimensional array, basically, right? And then we have a dense layer. This is our first dense layer. And now param, this is where things get scary. This is the number of parameters it has to play around with that it can tune as it back propagates. So right here, we saw before, every single one of these connections has a weight associated with it. So when we actually end up doing that out and do 16 times 784, that's the number of parameters we have to play around with. And we see that that is 12,560 weights that we are going to be tuning. And on the next one, it's only 16 by 16 connections, right? So we only have 272 weights. And on the final one, it's 16 times uh, 16 times 10. What am I? Oh, because it's adding the biases in as well. So there's biases in there that get added as well. And because of that, it's 10 nodes. So it's 10 biases as well. So we have those biasy parameters to play around with. So Essentially, what happens is we have all of these tunable parameters. And basically, if you want to just take this and turn it on its side, you can just visualize this is literally just layers of connected, interconnected nodes, right? So this is just a this is just 16 nodes lined up next to each other. This is 784 input nodes lined up next to each other, all connected to the next layer. Again, in this case, all connected to this layer right here. And it's quite literally just this guy turned on his side and the uh, represented in this form. So this is, again, graph summary, or models.summary is really useful for actually seeing the shapes of everything being fed into each other, right? So moving on here, let's talk about how training works, how model training works. So next up, we specify some training hyperparameters, the batch size and the number of epochs. <laughs> Excuse me. So the number of, uh, the batch size basically determines how the chunks that we take out of the data set before we do a weight update. And this can sometimes be important. We're going to do 50 here because we have 60,000. Essentially, this is the trade-off here is speed versus final accuracy. If your batch size is too large, you are going to accidentally jump over the true optimum at the end. But at the same time, you are going to... the example that I've heard thrown around a lot is that if you have low batch size, you're going to be a carefully calculating surveyor taking a single step down the mountain. You run through your entire data set, you figure out what direction is best to update all the weights in, and then you, uh, you update all the weights after every single training example, every single piece of data. Whereas high batch size is like a drunk man stumbling down the mountain. He will eventually get to a reasonably low point, but he might not reach the lowest possible point. It's a lot easier to get stuck in non-optimum uh, locations, which, again, by the end of it, we're talking like per, like small percents here. It's 50 is normally good for this. Traditionally, you use 32, 64, uh, powers of 2 up to about 256, depending on how large your data set is. But essentially, the batch size, again, it's the, the trade-off is fine reconstruction accuracy for the speed of the network. This is we basically go through 50 examples, 50 digits at the same time, and then make a decision based on all 50 of those digits on what direction to update our weights and biases, rather than making the decision to update weights and biases after every single training example, which would take a really long time. So. 
let's uh, move on, moving on here. The epochs again. That's the number of times that we pass the entire training data set through the model. And I'm saying that we're going to be doing 20 epochs. We're going to pass the data through 20 times. Normally, in models like the one that I've demonstrated here, we can see that for this model, I go through 3,000 epochs, where we pass the data through 3,000 times instead. So again, it's very model dependent. In our case, we really only need 20 epochs before we plateau. There's, it's This is a very simple data set where it's not Comp the features aren't complicated to learn. It can learn it reasonably quickly. So we only have to pass that data set through 20 times. So finally, TensorFlow, of course, is insane because they have this model compile feature, which makes things insanely fast. You get C++ level performance or C level performance in Python when you do this, because essentially the way TensorFlow works is all TensorFlow functions secretly are not actually there's eager mode and there's graph mode. And essentially, you're compiling every single TensorFlow function down. It's tracing the path and then implementing that natively to run in insane speeds. So it's uh, TensorFlow can be very, basically just as fast as native uh, C code, even though you're running it from Python, <laughs> which people sometimes take issue with that. It, it's true, though. It's uh, Python, despite normally being much slower for running code, TensorFlow basically cheats the system and has native execution speed via its graph compilation and graph system, which it's it's a very interesting system by all means. I, I think uh, people should definitely look into it more if they want to know how that works. Mm -hmm. But what's actually going on here is, so we compile with mean squared error. Mean squared error is just a loss function that basically, if you remember before, we literally, that's not what I want. Where are you outputs? Oh, I lost it. If you'll remember before, we converted our um, training labels into the correct output, the way that these final nodes are supposed to look at the end, right? So mean squared error loss basically just compares between what they actually look like and what they're supposed to look like as between the label, as the label specifies, right? What's actually coming out versus what we wanted to come out. And then that computes a single number that tells the network, this is how bad you did. And that's the network loss. And then it uses that loss to back propagate through and update all of the weights and biases, right? So we're passing an MSE just to tell it that that's the loss function. There's application specific loss functions where you can get like really complex loss functions. One of the, I'll talk about that more tomorrow and the research application that I have for it, because we're using a really complicated loss function for <laughs> a ton of stuff. But there is, so for this, we're just using mean squared error. Um, we're using an optimizer called Atom. We're not going to talk about optimizers at all. Just know that you should use Atom too, because Atom is the best optimizer. Uh, and then for the metrics, we're just going to be logging accuracy after each epoch. Again, accuracy being how, how many of the digits can you correctly identify? how many of the network how many digits can the network correctly classify out of those training examples so now what we do is we call fit and fit literally just trains the network for you you pass in the training images the labels the batch size the epochs and the validation split it does do so there's a thing called the uh, validation accuracy this is also just a tool to help you prevent from overfitting this is telling us that we're taking 10% of our training images and training labels each time to see the to use as validation that we're not going to be passing through and just checking against each epoch. So, and then finally, I save the model to a model file, these HDF5 files. Uh, then we run model evaluate with our test data and test labels. And then we just print out our test loss and our test accuracy. So let's actually run the model. Does anyone have any questions before I run them off? <laughs> any of uh, the code that could use better explaining? I'm sure there's stuff that I didn't explain well enough in here. I really glazed over the optimizer. Questions, questions, nothing? If not, we will proceed. Okay, let's run the model. So F5 and uh-oh, uh <laughs> what was that? Did I forget to, 
Okay. Looking good. Okay, we print out. Okay, now we're training. So as we can see, it's going through every single time this bar reaches the end, it's gone through 60,000 images. And it goes through that data set over and over again. It's taking, and we can see that the accuracy is improving. At the start, when we didn't know anything, we had very low accuracy. Now we're able to classify images 85% of the time, which is rather impressive. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at our final accuracy here. So our final accuracy is 88.4% classification accuracy. So that means that for every 100 images that we put in, basically 88 of them, it can correctly tell us what handwritten digit it is, which is pretty good overall, right? That's uh, that's very good performance to be able to get 188% uh, out of 100. If you showed humans handwritten digits, some humans wouldn't be able to correctly assess. I think the most recent statistic was like humans have like 90% handwritten digit classification accuracy. The thing is this data set has some really hard to read uh, handwriting samples in there as well. So there's definitely cases where the network is going to get better than humans. And we're going to see that actually with the next example. So any questions about the normal dense multi-layer perceptron network for classifying handwritten digits? We see that we get 88% accuracy. We see that as we train, the accuracy increases. Let's take a look. So the actual the accuracy, we start off epoch one, we have 32% correct classification accuracy by the end of it. The next one, we're up to 60% correct accuracy. The next one's 70. And then for the rest of it, we actually stay in the 80s, right? It gets harder and harder for us to get better because we're learning the features pretty fast. By this time, we're learning a lot of features. We've learned a lot of features, a lot of features. And then all of a sudden, it starts becoming a lot harder for us by about Epoch 12 to learn features. There's not much more that we can learn from this model using this it's it gets really hard for a multi-layer perceptron to learn anything else or extract any meaningful features from this data that it can use for classification which is why we can see it really plateauing up around uh 87 right so what's good about this is that we see that we haven't really overfitted because our test accuracy is the same as our final accuracy from the network right? So our final network accuracy was 87% on the training data. And we see that we're doing just as well on the testing data. This is stuff it's never seen before, but it's still getting really good accuracy, on, right? So that's uh, that's the multi-layer perceptron. No questions on multi-layer perceptron. Yes, no, we good? I will move on otherwise to the convolutional neural network model, which is going to be just as fun. Okay, on to the convolutional neural network. So let's go to CNN model. So it's quite literally exactly the same as before, except now we are using a different model. So we're still doing all the same stuff. We're loading the data, training data. We're doing the data split between training and testing. We specify our number of classes, our input shape. And now we're doing some dimension expansion here into... God, why am I dimension expanding? Is it for... Okay, right, right. We're we're forcing the images to have this shape because we need that as the input shape. So essentially, the images are coming into us as 28 by 28. Um, and for some reason, in this example, it didn't generalize. I guess so. We had to. I had to expand it myself again. Categorical. We split it up. Uh, we convert it to what the output should be. We convert our labels to what the output of our network should be. So now let's take a look at the model. And this is the only difference between the previous example. In this example, we're just using a basic multi-layer perceptron with a bunch of dense layers. In this example, we're using a convolutional neural network instead. And this is where things get fun. So the convolutional neural network, um, basically what we're able to pass into it, it for our uh, first thing, we're able to pass in the filter and the kernel size. Why am I passing in filters? What is filters? Am I crazy? Filters, the dimensionality of the output space. Oh, OK, OK. So that's the number of um, the output filters of the convolutions, right? So we pass in the filters. We pass in the kernel size, 3 by 3, right? So we, uh, in this example, this was a three by three convolution, right? We're taking a three by three chunk of pixels from the original image. That's the kernel size. 
and then we are convoluting it and applying our activation function that we're passing in as well here. You can see we're using relu as our activation function and going to a, we now have a feature map, a 32 by 32 feature map, I believe is, I'm not entirely sure why we have, is the 32 the, I, it might be 32 feature maps wide. That might be what it is. It might be the stacks of feature maps that we have, right? And then what we do is if we go, we see next we have the max pooling. Again, this is the popular convolutional neural network architecture. Convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, right? And we're getting smaller and smaller here though. We see that as we go down, we pool size, this divides the entire thing by two, right? This makes the size of our matrix, it shrinks it by two, right? It cuts it in half. Then again, we convolute on the uh, feature map there. And then again, max pooling on that once again. And then finally we flatten that. And then we do dropout with, uh, we drop 50% of the samples. This prevents overfitting in more complex models. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally a dense layer with 10 uh, perceptrons and we use soft max for probability of classification. So let's actually run this. And keep in mind, this is basically before in this one, we're actually training it. So we want it to have exactly one for uh, what we basically try to train it and force it to have one as the only thing that's on while everything else is off in this final layer. But in this case, we're going to be using softmax. So it's going to give us the probability that it thinks each one of these is the correct, is the digit. So as opposed to actually just trying to force all the other ones to zero, except the one we want as one, this one's actually going to give us the probability that it thinks something is a digit. So it's going to say, but still, ideally, we want the output to say, well, probabilistically, we want it to have 0% confidence that it's not an 8 and 100% confidence that it is an 8. Um, if you increase the dropout to six, uh, 0 0.65, will it increase the accuracy or decrease? So the issue is that the more dropout you have, obviously, the lower your accuracy is going to be. There's going to be a trade-off for sure. So the accuracy would decrease, but the, the reason that we have dropout in the first place is to avoid overfitting, which is, again, a dangerous example, is a dangerous thing where we could have it where we memorize the training data too well. Um, and again, I think I can show an example of overfitting somewhere in here. Let's see. You can see overfitting when the validation loss is higher than the training loss. Let's see. I really wanted an example of it where there was... I'm not going to be able to find an example in this one. But yes, so we want to just make sure the dropout is a way of protecting against the model memorizing everything because we're literally throwing stuff away and saying, hey, don't memorize this. I'm going to stop you from memorizing it by literally just throwing this value in the garbage. You should me be memorizing more general features. If it has memorized general features, it doesn't need to memorize. It doesn't need to to be storing all of this and passing it through every time. So we throw out 50% of the things randomly to try and tell it to stop memorizing the data exactly and learn more general features about the data, right? So that's uh, that's the reason we have dropout. And the more we increase this, of course, there is going to be an accuracy trade-off, but it's at the cost of it learning more general features, even with more complex models with more features or with more parameters. So. Let's uh, let's actually run this and take a look at the summary. Oh yeah, I'm doing categorical cross entropy instead. Oh my god, I'm doing categorical cross entropy. <laughs> I hate categorical. I uh, had a quite the experience with categorical cross entropy earlier this week, where I thought I was using categorical cross entropy for something. I was not using categorical cross entropy for it, and it, it cost me like three hours of my time. It was unfortunate. But, okay, so categorical, I thought we were using mean squared error for this. Categorical cross entropy literally com compares the softmax probability outputs to uh, the correct value. So it's, uh, we're going to see that this does a much better job. This is a much more, this is a much richer loss function for our output. So let's actually take a look. 
Uh, batch size now we're up to 128, but we're only going to do three epochs. Now this is this is what's cool because this means that essentially we're able to get insanely higher performance using a convolutional neural network, but we're only going through the data three times. Whereas on this guy, when we went through the data three times on the multi-layer perceptron, we were only up to 74% accuracy. We'd gone through the data three times, but we'd only been able to, after that, if we had just stopped the model right there, we would have only been able to correctly classify 74% of those handwritten digits. On the convolutional neural network, we can get 98% accuracy after only looking at after only going through the data three times and with a much higher batch size as well. So this is really, this means that our model here is learning because of the fact that we're using convolution here, we're able to identify much richer features. And that's, that's what makes this impressive. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Let's run it. Oh, we're going to actually see though, that convolution is much slower. And this is why every, this is what the GPU rush is all about. Convolution goes in parallel because it does it for all of the pixels. I'm computing on a CPU right now, so we can see we're not going in parallel, and it's going. It's taking a lot longer than um, the multi-layer perceptron did. So we can see here that it took 16 seconds for one epoch. For the last one, it was taking like two seconds per epoch. So we'll also take a look at these uh, out the shape of our network later as well. But right now, let's just take a look at these. Uh, at our network. So we can see already first one pass through of the data, and we're already at the same value of 20 epochs of multi-layer perceptron. For the convolutional neural network, second pass through, we're at 94% accuracy. We were capping at 88, like 88 last time. And now we can see that we're up to 96% accuracy. <coughs> we didn't lose any Thing at all on the test data, we got up to 98.3% at classification accuracy. 100 out of 100 handwritten digits, it only gets two wrong, which is crazy. That's really good performance. And we can see that this is uh, this is just a lot better. We've only gone through three times, and we, we're getting much richer features, and we're able to do much better classification, right? So does anyone have any questions about the convolutional neural network? Uh, I could explain categorical cross entropy and softmax, but that, that involves going into the math. And I know we don't want to go into the math tonight. I recommend we could also literally just not <laughs> do this. We could have this activation be the same as, uh, let's just have our activation be sigmoid like before. When in doubt, just do sigmoid guys for everything. Uh, except this convolution use relu. That's like one of the general rules is use relu for convolution. And you can see that was learned that was learned within the time span between Linet and AlexNet. Uh Linet used sigmoid for its convolution, but they went over to Alex used relu for the AlexNet, right? So <coughs> it's generally accepted to use relu activation for convolutional layers. And Normally you use uh oh wow they're using dry, they're using relu for their dense layers as well. That's a surprise. I thought they were gonna be using sigmoid for that. Okay. So I'm gonna use sigmoid for this and I'm going to switch this over to mean squared error as our loss. Just so I don't want to make things too complicated. Let's see how our performance is when we switch these over. And while we wait for this to train and take like 10 years. Um, I am going to, oh, that, that destroys it. Oh, that really destroys it. What have I done? What have I done? It's normalizing to 10% accuracy, which means it's basically randomly guessing. Okay. Well, this has been a terrible mistake. <laughs> I've made a terrible mistake. It does not, it does not like that. I could have sworn this should have worked. Why is it? This is one of those instances where I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it just has terrible accuracy. Okay. Well, I guess we will keep uh, we will keep soft max for classification here. I used I used sigmoid for this one, and this didn't have any issues with that at all. Huh. I wonder. That's interesting. Well, I guess it doesn't like uh, it. Really likes its categorical cross entropy then. Okay. So 
I will, uh, I'll keep it like this. This is what uh, most people use for their networks. They use softmax for um, categorical classification tasks like this, and then you use categorical cross entropy for your loss function. There's, I should probably explain what these do. So I explained softmax already, right? So softmax, again, softmax gives you the probability of each output being of that class. So we want ideally for it to be 100% an eight. If we pass an eight in, we want it to say, yes, this is 100% an eight, but maybe your eight kind of looks like a nine. So it thinks, oh, there's like maybe like a 10% chance it could be a nine, right? So that, that's what softmax does. But there's, and what categorical cross entropy does is it compares between that softmax output and the true ideal output of it um, in terms of what the real output is. That's the categorical cross entropy uh, loss. So um, other than that, let's actually just take a look at the model real quick before we wrap things up. So if we actually take a look at the shape of the model here, we can see that it's basically exactly what you'd expect, right? We have our convolutional 2D network. There's 320 open params here. Um, there's, it's 26 by 26. That's the image size, right? Um, and then 32, it's, we do 32, what are they calling them, features? No, they're calling them um, filters, yes. So we have 32 filters that basically just takes things into another dimension. So we have like this big 26 by 26 by 32 rectangle, uh, right? And that's why you always see an AlexNet, how, especially if we look at the AlexNet picture, we can see that they're using, they're using these rectangles, right? They're not using... They're not just using flat layers. You can see that they've stacked it back. So that's the number of quote unquote filters, right? And the filters I assume are getting different values. They're having, they have different features mapped to them is the general idea, right? So each of those features individually, it's a feature map and different features can get mapped to different filters. It's my understanding of that could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how that works. So then we can see max pooling 2D cuts this in half. It's, we go from 26 to 13 by 13 by 32. And then again, because that's literally just taking, we, we have our, our max pool, our pool size is two by two, which means we basically just take two by two squares and then of the entire thing, take the maximum value in that two by two square and then create a new squ set of squares with that. And that's why we're cutting everything in half. So every four squares get turned into one square, right? So then we do a convolution again. And now we're convoluting down to this new layer, but now we have 64 filters, which means we have an even richer feature space in there. And now we have, because we have 64 filters, we have even more parameters to play around with in those convolution layers. Finally, last convolution, last pooling layer, we cut it down again. We go from 11, obviously 11 doesn't divide evenly by two. So it, I, I don't know if it discards or combines one of the layers in, but now we are five by five by 64. Finally, we take this output of this max pooling, we flatten it down into 1600 uh, nodes. We pass that into the dropout layer and then finally the dense layer, which does the classification, right? So that's in general, that's, uh, that's convolutional neural networks. I do have one final demo I can show off where I can show, we have this image right here, this number two that I've drawn, I've hand drawn by myself. Um, it is called 2.png. And the way that this works in my test, let's see if this actually still works. We load the model. If you recall, we've previously saved the model by ourselves in the network. After we write it, we save the model to a model file, these HDF5 files. What's great about this is we can load these models back and use them fully trained whenever we want via these files. So because of that, I now have our model. I load the model in. And then essentially I load this image that I've hand drawn myself. I compile it over to a, I have this entire function. I have this entire thing that converts a PNG over to a format that can be properly read by our network. <laughs> uh, let's see if I, let's see. Okay. So this does image repair, right, right. So, you know, I am curious if this, I used to have, I used to have a thing that lets let me visualize this. I don't anymore. But essentially, what this demo does is this lets me demonstrate that I can legally uh, 
we can basically predict the output, right? So I'm pa I'm generating a piece of data, 28 by 28, that looks like and that's in the same data format as the inputs to our models. And I can cl correctly classify digits that I've hand drawn via our network, just to show the usefulness of our network. So let's uh, let's take a look at it, because this is the CNN. All right, so if I run this, it is going to load the model up. It is going to pass our image into our model. Oh, I did have it. So this is, the hand, this is how it sees the hand drawn too, right? So we pass it in. This is our two that we've drawn. If we take a look at the image here, yeah, it's a two. So let's go back to test model. Where did my, here we go. So we X out of that. And now it gives us the percentage that it is sure it is a thing. So it is 99% sure that the image I passed in is a two. Thus, we are pretty good, right? This is a... We've done pretty well for ourselves. So why don't we try something else? Um, again, these don't have to. So this is the this is what SoftMax does. SoftMax tells us what percent sure it is that it is something. These do not have to add up to 100. It calculates these independently. So it basically is saying, all right, it's a three. There's a three percent chance that I think it's a zero. And again, each of these perceptrons is computing this independently. These do not have to add up to 100%. Two is really sure that he's got it. He's like, I am 99.98% sure that this thing that you showed me is a two. Uh, three is like, I'm like very confident. Three is saying, I'm not confident at all that that's a three. Um, nine is saying, I'm 8% I'm sure that that's a, uh, a nine. And it's obviously wrong about that, but you can see why it might think that, right? A nine has some of these similar features. It has a big curve around the back. It has the over loop. The only thing that's different is it doesn't have this part down here and it doesn't have the curve that comes around and connects these two to form a thing, right? So you can see why nine thinks that, oh, maybe, maybe this is a nine and it's a bit confident that it might be. Obviously it's not very confident, but you can see why it might think, oh, maybe someone, you know, people how people draw nines if we pull up <laughs> paint some people will do their nines like uh you know some, something like that right so you can see why nine might be convinced that hey maybe your two that looks like this is actually a nine because it has the, it has some of the same features to it right it makes sense why it might mis make that mistake so what we can do here as well let's uh let's give it a really hard problem <laughs> let's all right, uh, if I open folder, reveal in folder, reveal in, reveal in folder, hello, am I crazy? Reveal in file explorer, oh yes. So then I click on edit for this, and now let's actually edit this and make our own, <laughs> make our own problem. So let's just white out the entire image first. Uh, oh God, I hate this new toolbar that they did. Let's see, let's just white the entire thing out. Brush size, very large. Oh, that is, that is not good. Come on, you got white. What? Oh, because I, I clicked. Why does it close after every time? I just want to erase the two. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, that, I, I'm pretty sure it's good for real now. Okay, so let us get... Now let's let's draw it. So who first person to say a number, we get to try that as the, the number that we're classifying. Four, four. Four, okay. Let's do four. Okay. So there's our there's our four. Let's save it. Um I don't know if I should make this bigger. I you know what? We're saving it. Okay. So now we have that. And now let's run our network again and see how well our network does. Now, this is very temperamental. I remember the last time I did this demo, it did not like most of my handwritten digits. Okay, it thinks it's a four, good. And let's see, it's 100% confident that nice. it's a four. <laughs> wow, okay. So it, uh, all the other ones are pretty low, but four is, says this is 100% a four. Wow, okay, so let's go again. Let's give it some random input and to ask it what it thinks. I would like to see a fancy one. Okay, let's do a fancy one. Uh, let's do a one so fancy that we can confuse it. 
it's pro I want to do a one that like it could mistake as a seven and show that it could mistake seven. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a something like how's that? Yeah, this. Okay. Thinner lines, it doesn't like thinner lines. And the reason it doesn't like thinner lines is because if we actually look at the MNIST data set, they never they use decently thin lines, but it's like most of them are kind of thick. And the way that this ends up going, it never seems to like it when I use thin lines. But we can, uh, I, I'll show you what happens when we use thin lines uh, next time. I'm using thick lines on purpose because I have bad experiences with it misclassifying thin lines. So let's, uh, let's take a look. I'll do thin lines next. So what do you think? Okay, there's one. And it is 96% confident that it is a two. <laughs> and you can see why i i, I kind of get that it doesn't think that this is a one it doesn't like this at all it's not that you broke it it's that no one writes ones like this <laughs> uh it literally thinks that it's like very unconfident that it's a, it's not confident at all that's it let's go take a look at yeah it doesn't even think it's a seven it's like no nah, this isn't a seven zero percent chance this is a seven 96 percent chance that this is a two and i can i can kind of see why they probably think that someone just scuffed it to really bad like i can i can see why because it's like okay if you draw your two like this by accident they probably thought it was like oh yeah i uh <laughs> something like that right so a seven with a dash in the middle all right let's uh you know what i want to let's start let's start trying fancy things uh d -d -d erase okay all right let's uh let's do you know what let's make it a bit thinner uh the issue here is that so you're gonna see how it actually interprets this and why i'm doing it super thick so even though this looks like the thickness of the mnist data set when it converts we see that it actually isn't and that's what the biggest issue is so when i actually run this we're going to see that the input to the network looks a lot thinner than it's supposed to be. So this is the seven here that we've drawn. Um, this actually doesn't look as thin as I thought it was going to. So let's uh, let's see what it thinks. Uh, it's pretty sure it's a three. 99% <laughs> confidence that uh, we have a three right there. So that's normally why I like to do thicker ones is because it's a lot better at identifying... I actually let me see how it's how is it when is it doing that print Matt plot will show image is that legal can I do that wait can I oh hold up let me <laughs> we're going back here and taking a look at the data that it was trained on in basic network so if I literally just uh, well we have to load the training data first but let's load this Come on. All right. Load the data. Good. Import mat plot lib dot pi plot as plot. Okay. So now if I do plot dot show train labels sub one, this will actually show us the five or train labels sub zero. Oh, they, they don't like that. What don't they like? Show takes one positional argument, but two were given. Is that two? Oh, labels. My bad. I meant to do train images. Let's see if it likes that. It still doesn't like that. I'm literally giving it. What does it want? It takes one positional argument, the two we're getting. Is train images not what I think it is? Am I just crazy? No, that is the pixel data. Okay. Yes, I would like to I would like to do plot show. Did I miss something in this it literally lets me do it here which is why i'm somewhat confused i guess the image format that i put oh it's because i don't what shape does it say this is the shape should be the same hang on dot zero dot shape it's 28 by 28 do they want me they don't want me to expand it do they why I'm still sad that this doesn't work. Takes one positional argument, but two were given. I, I'm fairly certain I did not give it two arguments. I'm pretty sure that this is just one argument. Does anyone see why this is two arguments? <laughs> uh, show. 
takes one argument. Oh, Matt Show. That's what I wanted. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, why? Why does it not work? Oh, no. Wait, wait. Do they not actually show it? Do I actually have to run plot.show? Plot.show. Come on. No, I just want to show. Come on. There we go. Okay, so we can see that this is what a 5 looks like to the MNIST uh, data set. Oh, it does not like that. But hey, it worked. <laughs> so we get to see uh, we get to see what the input to the MNIST data set is. So the reason it's weird is because this is handwritten with a pen. And our data that we're putting in looks nothing like this. <laughs> because it's, it's basically identifying handwritten features. And ours looks really clunky and awkward ms paint <laughs> features right so that's why uh that's why it's really bad and you can see why they think this is a three too right like they think that this is whoop, whoop, like you can see how this could be mistaken for a three very easily so i don't fault the network for being like 99 percent sure that this is a three um let's take a look at is there anything else we want to see we want to see it uh mess up a bunch on classification There's a lot more funny stuff we could mess it up with. You could do a smiley face and see how sure it is that we have a smiley face. Oop. Let's see what it thinks this is. So this is one of the flaws of training neural networks in this manner, is we are going to see that if we run this, we will see Yes, so I can, whoever DM'd me, uh, that, can you do a letter? Yes, you can. I'm doing, you can do weird symbols and stuff, but again, this is the big flaw, and this is why machine learning is, you should not be worried that machine learning is going to take over the world anytime soon, because this, they are literally, they do exactly what you train them to do. So I have trained this model to identify digits, which means if we put in anything that's not a digit, it is going to give us a hilarious answer that does not make any sense. So I have put in this thing with a big dot in the middle that's not a real letter, not a real number. So it is going to have a very, very hard time. It is pretty sure that that's a nine. We can, it's pretty sure it's a zero, it's decently sure it's a zero, but it's like pretty sure it's a nine, when in reality that makes no sense. There's no reason that it should think it's a nine, but it for some reason does, right? Th that's the flaw with this model is that essentially it has to think it's something. It's trained to think that it has to be something because every single training example we've given it is a real valid number. So it has reason to assume that it has to be a real valid number, right? Do what? What am I supposed to be doing? What am I putting in? <laughs> we can put in uh, we can put in a nonsensical letter next if we want. Um, let's clean this out. Switch over to white. What am I, Matt? What do you want me to put in? Eyeballs. Oh, no. It was the, oh, the uh, image. The issue exactly. here is the fact that this is multi-channel. If it, I need it to be black and white, <laughs> grayscale. So that's, uh, we can... I wonder what it's going to convert this to if I do it. <laughs> I, can, I can try. I mean, there's nothing stopping me from trying. It would take... be funny all the same. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, God. All right, so I think we have to downsize this to 25 by 25. So let us resize to 25 by 25 pixels, or is it, is it 28? I think it's 28. 28 by, do not maintain aspect ratio, 28. Okay, and now he is a very tight compressed boyo. And let's take a look. Uh, just make sure first. Yeah, 28 by 28. Good. Okay. So it is going to... Okay, so it's going to scale it. I don't know how it's going to handle this. I'm expecting a crash once it sees that this is multi-channel. But at the same time, it might not. Oh, look at that. Okay. So this is what it sees it as. And let's see what it thinks it is. 
oh, look at that. It actually is so confused. It actually doesn't think it's anything. But it is reasonably confident that it's an 8. 30% confidence that it's an 8. So, I mean... I can kind of see an 8. <laughs> yeah, if we... Uh, I, I can kind of see it. Because 8 is, like, the fattest number that's most likely to be in that box shape, right? Like, I, you can... <laughs> well, it's not it's not perfect. If someone like smushed an eight with uh black ink, like they re- decide they ended up doing something like uh that is not is not the paintbrush tool. Someone, you know, uh something like that could end up being that shape, right? <laughs> so I I mean you can see why it's like thirty percent. Yeah, maybe that's an eight. But it's doing a good job overall because it can say, okay, I, I, I have no idea what this is, which is more than more than most things. And that's why Softmax is probably better. If we ran this with uh, the other guy, he'd have absolutely no idea what's going on. But in the for the sake of time, it's 10 o'clock, so we are not going to run it with the other guy. <laughs> Anything under 30 should print, I have no idea. Normally what you do is you have a separate class for I have no idea, and so instead of having 0 through 9, you have 0 through 9, and then the I have no idea option. But then you have to feed it invalid options for every literally everything else. So anything else should be a I have no idea, and then that's going to increase the size of your data set and make things more complicated. So that's normally why, for applications like this anyway, you, ca- you can have softmax to have it be like I have no idea via these probabilities. But yeah, all right. Any other uh, any questions before we wrap things up? I know this workshop was a lot to take in. A lot of information. I hope I've proved that you can do machine learning without knowing the math too much, though. These, pro- these programs shouldn't look that intimidating. It's about f- less than 50 lines. Model.fit does all of the work for you. All you have to do is build the network load the data build and by build the network i mean literally just stack a bunch of pre-made layers together in the keras api um once you stack those layers together then you uh compile them run fit run evaluate save your model and use it at a later date and again if we want to take a look using the model is comically easy you run you literally just run load model with the model file, and then you literally just call on the model as if it's a function, pass in your input data, and it gives you the output data, right? So our model, our CNN model, has been trained to take in a 28 by 28 image and output probabilities of what it thinks the number is, right? So once you train that one time, you now have this model to use whenever you want. You can run this however. So. I don't know if anyone actually followed along and typed this in on their own, but I will make the code. The code is already public. I will share it with everyone. Let us, let me go grab the code on GitHub so I can share the link. Is in a repository called IEEE neural networks tensorflow and this is actually the exact same code that i used for the last neural networks workshop uh but that one kind of that was a that one we actually tried to go through the math and this time i wanted to not go through the math and try and hopefully simplify things just a little bit um what about applications like mobile net for transfer learning that is beyond the scope of my expertise i merely work with uh, variational autoencoders is my main area of expertise. I've never heard of mobile net <laughs> or transfer learning for that matter. <laughs> I work very heavily with uh, natural language processing stuff. But there is, I'm sure, yes, there's a lot, a lot more applications and a lot more types of networks and different types of learning. We even get to talk about like the real good stuff like Q learning and reinforcement learning and like the stuff that they use to train uh ais and video games to be better than the top players of all time stuff like that the field of ai is massive there's a lot of lot of sub areas that you can go into so uh with that any other questions before we wrap things up
Okay, well, with that, I'll go over the schedule for the rest of the week. Uh, let's go back. All right, so with that, how does a computer have better grammar than you? That's just because computers have the entire dictionary at their fingertips. And are, are we talking grammar or spelling? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> if both, then it's because it has the entire dictionary. In terms of grammar, it's because they have some crazy neural network that can basically detect grammar. That is a natural language processing application. They're probably using an LSTM for that, I would assume. No, you know, they've probably moved on to transformers. Transformers are like three years old at this point. I'm sure all of the modern grammar checking applications use transformers. Um, but yeah, it's there's lots of lots of applications in machine learning. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, with that, for the rest of the week, tomorrow, um, I'll be giving a research talk on my research with variational autoencoders. We're going to be covering generational methods a bit more. Um, it's kind of an in-depth talk, and it's probably going to be like two hours around. By all means, don't feel compelled to come to the entire thing. But if you are interested in more machine learning stuff and machine learning applications, uh, tomorrow is a fun talk. I'm going to be going over all the different types of variational autoencoders and up to the most la the latest versions and the state of the art, which is very, very cool stuff that we have going on and what we're using them for in the data mining and management lab. Um, after that, we are going to be doing Friday. We have side project development night. It's the last side project development night of the year. Uh, then finally on Monday is going to be the last meeting of the normal semester, and we're going to be having a networking event in place of our uh, coding night. We're going to be, it's going to be a how to basically set up your LinkedIn, how to set up your GitHub, and basically just get your, uh, really get your online profile up and connect with some of the graduating seniors who are probably, hopefully all going to be at uh, good jobs next year. You'll be able to contact them. So. With that, I, I'm pretty sure that's everything. We're also um, we're also going to be having a, for officers, we're having a meeting on the 18th after finals. So yeah, good luck with finals, everyone, and midterms as well. That's uh, I know that's the big, uh, the big topic of, as of late. But I'm happy you all took time out of your busy final schedules to come to this workshop. I think it was a good last workshop. I hope everyone got something out of it. Um, I wanted to, I really wanted to try and make it less math intensive. I hope I end up scaring you away more. Uh, there's definitely gentler introductions <laughs> and by no means am I, uh, am I super qualified to be teaching about neural networks, <laughs> but I think it was, uh, it's fun to be able to just look at the basic TensorFlow networks and see what they're doing. And for those of you who are a bit more advanced and more interested in stuff, it's also fun to see the state of the art in variational autoencoders tomorrow. So by all means, I hope to see you there as well. So with that, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, any other questions before I dismiss? OK, well, with that, thank you, everyone, for coming. Meeting dismissed. Bye-bye. <laughs>